you never really know what someone else's status is simply by the test. Essentially, you will catch HIV from someone who is HIV negative. All right. Hey guys, this is Kaden. Welcome to episode 5 of the Diaries Behind How to Stay Positive When You Test Positive. HIV information and advocacy usually focuses on prevention, which is great and very necessary. But you can never have enough voices that tell you exactly what it feels like to actually live with HIV today and answer all your questions. So that's what the project is going to be and it's going to come out in autumn. And in the meantime, I've asked some of the amazing people who agreed to be part of this project to join me to talk about issues that surround HIV and sex work is one of them. Now, throughout this video, keep an eye on the bottom of the screen. The bar will be corresponding to what we're talking about and the links to all of that you'll be able to find in the description. Today I have with me Jason Domino, HIV and sex work activist. He's one of the biggest drivers of political change in this country for sex workers. He's recently been working on a porn pledge which will take care of HIV in the porn industry. He's the founder of the Domino Foundation, the creator of Porn for Prep and the Good Porn Project. I love you and I love what you do. What have you been up to recently? So you mentioned the pledge earlier. That's yeah. one of the main things that I've been working at the moment is speaking to different studios and making sure that they're aware of bits and pieces within the sort of sexual health field and things that uh, charity has been trying to say to the wider public but maybe it hasn't gotten into the porn industry very mm -hmm. clearly. Particularly in the straight side, we find sometimes the gay industry has been talking about some of this conversation and it's about how do we get this happening for everyone, how do we get the awareness out for everyone. Right, the, the conversation isn't an easy one to have, particularly for negative people and you bridge that, um, those worlds very they're not two separate worlds, let's face it, but you, you, you connect those two very easily. Obviously it's not two different worlds, but sometimes it does feel that way because like, how do people that don't have HIV, how can they talk about these subjects? They haven't lived with the experiences at the same time. If we're not able to get allyship going, then we will make any progress. Exactly, and it's so, so important, particularly because there are so many more people who are at risk of HIV, who don't have HIV, who don't necessarily think that it's an issue that applies to them. Why is it important for people who are negative to know that you equals you, to know about PrEP? If you know about PrEP, then you know about um, the different ways that you can protect yourself. And paired with that bit of information, you have to have the other side of the story, which is the knowledge of what you equals you means to you as a negative person. And how you treat other people is a very uh, integral part of, of mm. that. So it's. It's, it's the wider picture of that. But the other side of that, as I say, you have to also make sure that people understand that not only um, is there no PrEP without U equals U, but there's also no U equals U without PrEP. What I mean by that is, for some people, they're not in a stage where they're undetectable yet, or maybe they're having difficulty getting there or whatever. And for some people, actually PrEP's a really good tool for their partner to maybe be using while they're in that stage when they're worried about maybe being transmittable. So. The two, the two issues connected yeah. are so much stronger. There's, um, there's a term that you, you, you taught me, which is the negative test result holder. And it's, I think, uh, one of the most important messages when talking about you because you. Would you like to elaborate on that? The world isn't as simple as someone who's HIV positive and someone who's HIV negative. Because actually, in real life terms, you never really know what someone else's status is simply by the test. So a really useful tool that I found is not just referring to someone as HIV positive or HIV negative, but actually referring to people that are, you would normally say HIV negative. I actually call them an HIV negative test result holder because then you're able because to... You never know. Exactly. I mean, you know that they've had a test. You don't know exactly whether HIV has developed enough to show up on the test or not. Because the window periods. Exactly. Right. And you don't know exactly when they had their test. So it kind of pulls up all of that. Just because they're a test result holder doesn't actually mean they may not have HIV. There might be someone who has it and it right. is undiagnosed and untreated. Most people catch HIV from someone who didn't know that they had it. Isn't it funny because in their mind they are negative or maybe there's a thought that says, oh, I haven't tested but I'm just going to identify it with being HIV negative. Mm -hmm. And essentially you will catch HIV from someone who is HIV negative. And that's the crazy part. 
It's a widely known fact that minorities are particularly affected by HIV and one of those minorities are sex workers. You work at the forefront of this. Tell me, why do you think that is? Why do you think sex workers are particularly affected by HIV? What leads to that? So, it's an interesting situation because actually generally a lot in the UK there's actually very good sexual health around sex workers. I mean, actually because it's taken professionally, a lot of sex workers go fairly often to, to have tests mm -hmm. and they you know they see it as a matter of, of taking care of their, their business but you can't always rely on your clients to take that same level of care mm -hmm. so that's some of the reasons why we, you know we can be a, a, a particularly effective community are we comfortable telling our clients should we be HIV positive that we're HIV positive and also what is the law around um, what is the law around a sex worker not disclosing their status? Because I think it's a very complicated issue that there's a lot of ethics that ties into it. There's a lot of old bias that ties into it. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? It does go into um, an area where sometimes people are like culturally influenced quite a lot. So for example, in, in America, there are still some quite outdated laws which are very stringent on people uh, disclosing their HIV status before sex even though actually we're aware that those same laws don't actually produce uh, effective results for reducing HIV a lot of the time. And CDC has officially said that undetectable means untransmittable. Exactly. Right? Uh, the, the CDC, yes. Right. Um, that was 2015. Okay. So it's uh, it absolutely, it's, it's one of these issues where uh, we'll see a parallel going on in, in, in France where the Supreme Court, in, in front, uh, the High Court in France, said that again you can't be uh, you, you can't be uh, penalized for, for for that same thing because there is no risk from someone who is an undetectable so actually it's not it's not up to you to to tell someone that there's no risk going on there it'd be the same way as me because I have epilepsy like I wouldn't need to tell my my sexual partner that if I choose if I chose to that's that's my choice um, so there we go I mean the sex does have its own inherent risks in certain ways and, and you know the bed could break underneath you and these you know like <laughs> do, do you tell them about okay well this bread this bed maybe had like a, a, a slat there which is a bit dodgy like does it bed is HIV positive <laughs> is it undetectable but though? we know with an undetectable that that's less risk than a partner who's had a test ages ago so would, it, would you need to tell your partners I think I'm HIV negative because of a test I had ages ago. it's it's doesn't make sense right but I hear that there's um, people feel like when you when you don't tell them that you're rubbing them off choice and it's unethical to not give them the choice because a lot of people feel that it's valid to be able to decide whether you have sex with someone who's undetectable or not but I feel like this like this is all like really knotted because like you said when someone is negative, it gives us so much comfort for some reason. That's when HIV is transmitted, when someone doesn't know usually, right? And um, we don't, I feel like that not a lot of people get comfort from hearing that someone's undetectable and it would really be life and well-being saving. Do you think that this is why um, the reactions that people get have anything to do with the fact that sex workers who have their financial well-being tied into their work and their sexual status mm -hmm. and everything, uh, don't necessarily disclose. Disclosure is also really kind of like outdated because it's like you're talking about a client. And there's no good words that start with this. You should. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an interesting one because obviously, as you say, like sex workers, we rely on the money which clients give us. And so uh, are they going, are, are sex workers going to tell clients necessarily this situation, particularly if there's no risk for their clients? But at the same time, if a client found out, and they were unhappy, then potentially that same client could become a real problematic person for the, for the sex worker in future. Potentially be someone that says all sorts of horrible things online. Violence. Which happens anyway. Forced disclosure. This is the type of stuff. I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of the work that I do is actually getting in the, in the sex work community talking about mm. the sort of the, the serophobic, the, the fear of people living with HIV specifically. Um, that element that can play out in, in, in violence against sex workers. It's as simple as people not understanding enough about HIV to know how to make those rational decisions and react in rational ways. And that's not just a pressure on sex workers, it's a pressure on society to have these conversations. Yes. As far as I'm concerned, I try to educate people 
ahead of time so that I'm not in a situation where someone panics on me because for me to deal with that is a burden and for them I can't even I mean I don't know if you've had an HIV scare but they're gonna think oh my god I'm gonna get AIDS and die I'm gonna get AIDS and die I'm gonna get AIDS and die you're kind of repeating these words in your in your head so it's good to talk about it but I know that a lot of you aren't ready I think it's okay for you not to disclose your status just make sure you're not putting anyone at risk but uh, if, particularly if you're undetectable uh, there's no question about whether or not people deserve that that information because it's not theirs to to have unless you want to give it to them I think it's probably a good leaf to follow maybe the trans community with this because they've dealt with do we disclose about our, our history or not mm. and a lot of people choose to disclose simply as a way of avoiding people that will later become uh, as you say can become painful people maybe they can be problematic and shout at them and all sorts of things you're basically so, avoiding mental trauma for yourself yeah i mean I, i've gone through an hiv scare and it's difficult but at the same time i'm now at a place where i i take prep and i specifically don't ask people to tell me their <coughs> status unless they unless they feel like they actively just want to in case it's something yeah. that they want to tell Absolutely, and you, uh, the Jason talks about this and porn for prep, the link to which is in the description below. There's more to law when it comes to sex work than just disclosure around HIV. Sex work is not fully decriminalized in this country, is it? So what we have in the UK is a partially decriminalized model. The sex work itself is, is, is allowed, but everything around it isn't. So, so can, I, can I live with another escort? No. Why? <laughs> it's, at that point it becomes a brothel and brothel, I mean, at the same time, some of these laws aren't actively used, particularly for a long amount of time, but it does make you potentially vulnerable, maybe uh, even if you're traveling elsewhere, these sort of situations can kind of flag up and it adds to the extra levels of marginalization that, that sex workers can face. And also can mean that sex workers aren't, are less likely to speak to the police when they need help or less likely to go to hospital and actually maybe get PEP after a situation where they've, they've you know, maybe been assaulted or something like that. And all of these, all these extra values come together because of these extra steps of the law. I guess we're also less likely to call the police if something happens to the client. Here, sex work is partially decriminalized. In New Zealand, it's fully decriminalized, right? But there's also other ways of dealing with sex work around the world. One of the different ways is actually called the Nordic model. And it's basically, or the end demand model, or the Swedish model, they keep making up the names. End demand? End demand. End demand. And the idea is that you make it illegal for someone to purchase sex, but it's still legal for them to sell it. To, uh, to protect sex workers. The idea is that the sex worker won't be arrested, but the client could be arrested. The problem with this is when the client is criminalized, the sex worker is kind of criminalized by proxy because the sex worker is less likely to work in places where it's transparent, they're less likely to work with police. Uh, in, a, in cases of an assault, is the sex worker going to give the police access to their phone? Because potentially your phone has a client list, all of which might be arrested, and then oh, suddenly, yes. and you're just doing this because you want to give them evidence about an assault. This is almost like... If you do this, then suddenly you're getting rid of your entire income, potentially. But although that's stepping over a boundary, some people, will, it'll be their worries. And then also, uh, something that I demonstrate is, so I have epilepsy. And if, it, uh, if I was in a country which has this uh, end demand model, my client could be arrested. If I had a seizure and my client was standing there, would they call 999? Would they get help? Uh, or would they just stand up and leave the room? If they were worried about being arrested, it's quite likely that they wouldn't want somehow to be implemented into this whole story and maybe just leave me and see and hope that maybe my seizure plays out and I'm safe. Plenty of sex workers deal with uh, other issues, maybe overdoses, all sorts of other, without going into a sort of stereotype, there is still a number of uh, specific incidents where this also plays out. Any time when a sex worker needs help, is a client going to feel comfortable being someone that gets extra help? Mm. There's a difference between legalization and decriminalization. So in a number of countries, you've got legalization where everything is very regulated. You know, you you will get a you will get a license to be able to sex work if you have your test. Like in Amsterdam, is that uh, Amsterdam they have similar this sort of structure in Germany. Um, so you've got these these sort of rules that you follow. The problem with all of this is it gives control to people that may at some point just be very anti-sex work 
and at some point just try and reduce the numbers. And all of this means that those who are most marginalized may be uh, the people that are unable to afford certain ways of keeping up with this access are just going to do it completely off the grid and that means that they're then vulnerable to exploitation via uh, the gangs and other structures. So it doesn't necessarily help, it just pushes a group of people that do it because they can like, afford and privilege enough to be able to do it in one section and the people that do the underground versions the most harmed in another section. So it criminalizes the most vulnerable. Absolutely. What do we need to do to fix this? What do we want? We really do need full decriminalization because at the moment, sex workers are taking safety measures to keep themselves safe, such as living with other people so that they can call out and get help if they need. Mm -hmm. And they're being penalized technically by the law for doing that. And it's being put through as other different types of law like brothel keeping or sometimes it's been called trafficking, all these sorts of other different laws being applied onto sex workers when actually the sex workers are just trying to do their job safely. Mm -hmm. That needs clarifying because the other issues, things like targeting trafficking, have their own specific laws. Things like assault has its own specific laws. You, people are going to lump it into one category, don't they? Absolutely. And, it, and it's like, well, actually work with sex workers. You'll get far more information. We're people. Ex ex hey. Honestly, like when you have good relationships with us, then we're able to say things openly. Clients, if they don't feel like they're going to get arrested, also giving information to people where it's needed. Yeah. And the whole industry gets to a place mm -hmm. where like unionization can increase the, the quality of standards for people in the industry. It, it gets it to a place where people can leave the industry when they need. Right. Um, all of this, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty basic steps that happen mm -hmm. in other industries. There's a lot of shame around uh, doing sex work, isn't there? If you guys have not seen a TED talk by Juno Mack, the link is in the description below. And she says that, you know, people ask, oh, would you want your daughter doing it? The question isn't, would you want your daughter doing it? Because that question is never under your control. Like, if she's going to do it, she's going to do it whether you want it or not. Even if the law chooses it's having to, sex. Your not. daughter's sucking dick. <laughs> the question is, if she's doing that, would you want her to be able to call the police or get help right. easily? And those are the things that we can change. What do you think is needed to so I would say, first off, have a look at decrimnow.org.uk. In the description. Uh, Juno Mack also wrote with Polly Smith an, an amazing book called uh, Revolting Prostitutes. Also in the description um, of that. <laughs> There's a lot in this description. Um, so they're really great places to start. But also, as a, soci as a society, we should be looking at making it a hate crime across the UK uh, when someone attacks a sex worker. Because in different places, it currently is. Which it should be. Absolutely. Always, right? And also, a very interesting uh, concept that I feel was explored in a film called Savage, to which the link is in the description below, <laughs> um, where there was a rape scene, which a lot of people didn't perceive as a rape scene, and the TED Talk, we, uh, not TED Talk, we didn't do a TED Talk yet, but we did a panel <laughs> yeah. together uh, with Impulse um, London after one of the screenings, I asked people to, by show of hands, show me who thought there was a rape scene in the movie and about 50% of people didn't think so. And I don't know if it was because it was a male being sexually abused or uh, because it was a sex worker and he obviously, you know, went there, is getting the money for it. I've heard so many times people saying things like, oh yeah, but he's paying you for your time, so he's buying you for the time. You're not buying mm -hmm. anything, you're not buying my body, you just rent my services. Mm. And that still has stays that's, intact that's for still has rules. Absolutely, because it's still my body. You shouldn't allow people to do things to your body that you don't want done to your body. It's bodily autonomy. It's like ABC of mm. growing up. We've gotten so used to saying uh, no means no when it comes to when it comes to sexual assault. The the issues with that are it's really it, yes that's a really important message and it's good that people are being aware of that. But sometimes it isn't even just when it's vocalised. Sometimes there's actually, yes, vocalization is an important part, but actually sometimes people are, maybe they're not in a place where they're comfortable saying no, and they're still, they're, that doesn't mean that it's not a, a, an act of violence against them. So again, we need to maybe be a little less literal with that and just be aware of the surrounding stuff. I think there's a lot to unpick there because there's a lot of role play as well happening where no won't necessarily mean no, but you can tell someone's really uncomfortable. I really hope that we get to a place quite soon where people are going to be more well, uncomfortable 
expressing themselves and saying when they find something uncomfortable because you it's your, and you're, you're in your full right to do that even if you do sex work and two uh, for clients to be more attuned to that and actually pay more attention to whether someone feels safe in their company so some of the places where this deep grim message is being vocalized is, is online where you'll see a lot of sex worker activists again some of them have been doing this for some time but only starting to get listened to now we've seen marches we've seen occupations and one of the one of the ones that we're doing uh, this year is we're in pride in london so we've got the the voices from the sex industry section uh, in the pride Can't march and we've, we've got representation about prep we've got representation about u equals u representation about decrim all explaining the issues there and giving people information to be able to find out more yes make sure you look yeah. out for us we're going to be there on pride day and this takes me to Karen. The first time Karen appeared in the series was when Greg said, "Like I don't want a straight, white, heterosexual woman be sitting in an office in a public health building somewhere, Fuck off saying, <laughs> why can't gay men just wear condoms? Bye, Karen. Karen is not just straight, cisgender people who can't relate to being queer. There's a lot of Karens in our community. It's a random name. It's not even a person, really. Karen is kind of the, the, the flaw in the system that doesn't cater to sexual and ethnic minorities in the UK. It is improving, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And I was wondering if you would like to ask Karen a question or if you have a request for Karen. Mm. Hi, Karen. I would imagine that you maybe also, as well as like ethnic minorities, maybe have difficulties with certain minorities like sex workers and sometimes maybe try to help us as a community without talking to us. And actually, I would say, again, this classic line, nothing about us without us. If you want to help us at the moment, a great place to start is to celebrate some of the sex workers out there. Listen to their stories, not just the stories of, oh, sex work was the low point in our life, but actually, this is my work, this is how I do it, and this is how I stay safe, and this is how other people can stay safe, and this is what we're doing, self-organizing. That's how you can help as an ally, Aaron. Take it with you. Bye, Bye Karen. Karen. What's your social media? I mainly use Twitter, but I do have a Instagram account. I use Facebook and anyway. And all of that is in the description below for you if you want to follow Jason. We've come to the end of episode five of the diaries behind how to stay positive when it's just positive with Jason Domino. The next episode will come out you next month. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe and turn on your notifications for updates. And if you're interested in anything that we talked about in this video, Make sure you check out the description below for additional links. I look forward to sharing how to stay positive when it is positive with you in autumn. And I will see you very soon. Mwah. A bit red. You're looking nice and pink. I love it. There's life in you. <laughs> Maybe it's my top. So. You maybe, pick. Maybe, maybe allergic maybe reaction to sex work. <laughs> <laughs> See, he I'm hates us I'm really. I'm becoming red. I'm becoming red, so I can. Embarrassed much about what you just said. <laughs>